So uh, today we will be learning insurable risks and uh, who is an insured and who is an uh, insurer. In fact, we already learned about the concept of insured and the insurer. When I gave you the introductory class, it is the very first lecture on insurance law. I spoke about who is the insured and who is the insurer. And of course, you know that the insurer is a person who insures. That is an insurance company and insured is a person uh, person or a product or a property that is, uh, you know, covered by the insurance policy. So apart from that, a very important concept that we are going to study today is insurable risks. As we all know that the purpose of insurance is to cover risks and losses, risks and losses that are contingent or may be seen or foreseen, or sometimes they may apprehend certain risks. Like, for example, apprehension could be, you know, accidents. So, uh, you know, vehicle accidents. So you have this motor vehicle, uh, uh, you know, insurance uh, policy or, you know, life insurance policy and so on. So when you, uh, you know, apprehend a particular risk or a loss, uh, that would cause some damage. So in order to cover that damage, a person would, you know, uh, procure or purchase an insurance policy. So the person who purchases um, is normally the one who is insured against all the risks. And um, the insurance company is the insurer and the risk that is covered is the insurable risk. Now, what is this insurable risk? Now let us go in deeper and check what is insurable risk. Now, uh, before I go through the slides, I just want you to only think about certain things, okay? So that is the reason first, I want to give you a brief introduction so that I will set the perspective and then we can uh, you know, go through our slides and see what the slides say. Now, uh, again, reiterating the part of risk, insurance is for the purpose of covering the risks. What kind of risks they are? For example, if you are um, insuring your house, so there would be different types of insurance. There could be general insurance policy or there could be fire insurance or theft insurance. So if you are uh, purchasing uh, you know, uh, fire insurance, that means you're protecting your property or your house against fire. So the risk of fire, so you're trying to cover the risk of fire, right? So, for example, if it is health insurance, so you apprehend a problem uh, or you apprehend the risk of health failure or probably even, you know, sometimes death of a person. So that means you're trying to ensure health of a person. So that is the risk that you want to cover. So that is insurable risk. So it depends whether it's a life or fire or health. So that is insurable risk. So Basically, apart from that, what we are trying to see in insurable risk is, I want you to remember this, that the risk that you are trying to cover has to be, uh, you know, it should be, uh, be able to be like quantified or to the extent that, you know, you know, you should be able to measure the loss in case there is a loss or a damage to that particular thing or to the risk that you're trying to cover. So the insurable risk should be capable of being quantified or so to say should be uh, you know, capable of being measured. So this is one of the important element of insurable risk. So it is a risk that can be covered. And the next aspect of it is it is a risk that can be quantified or it is something that can be calculated, yeah? So for those who are uh, still joining, in fact, I'll just wait for another. Yes, for those who have just joined in, we are talking about insurable risks. In today's class, we are going to learn about insurable risk. We already learned about what is insurance policy. We learned about who is the insured, that is the thing, property, or person who is being insured whose loss or whose risks are covered. An insurer is a person or a company who, uh, you know, uh, you know, covers the risk or a loss or a damage for the insured. So that is the insurance company. So we are talking today basically in terms of the risks that are covered, risks that are capable of being covered under the insurance policy is insurable risks. For example, health of a person, property of a person, 
uh, or you know, protection of property against fire or protection of a motor vehicle against accidents. So things that can be you know, measured or you know, which is quantifiable, it can be, uh, you, know, you can really uh, measure the loss or measure the risk. There should be a kind of definiteness or kind of a measurability uh, that could be uh, you know, literally uh, spoken in terms of, uh, you know, of financial terms or pecuniary terms that can be really calculated. So risks should be, be able to be you know, calculated or measured, right? So this is what the concept is all about, insurable risk and the type of property or the risks that can be insured um, they have to see that whether the risk that is uh, going to be covered, whether it is insurable risk or not, whether it is capable of being covered by an insurance policy or not. So the insurance company will first of all check whether the risk is insurable in nature. So that is insurable risk. Now let's go on to, uh, to the slides. Okay, so the slides say that a risk that is capable of being insured or covered under a valid insurance policy could be termed as insurable risk. So just as I said earlier, that should be capable of being insured. Thereby, the risk in question needs to conform to the criteria and the stipulations of the insurance policy. A risk may not be considered as insurable if it is incalculable, if you cannot determine the, the price or cost, or you cannot attribute you know, a kind of uh, monetary value for the thing. That means it cannot be called as an insurable risk because the purpose of insurance is that you, um, you know, claim in terms of money, you claim uh, in term, in pecuniary terms or financial or monetary terms rather. So therefore a risk may not be considered as insurable if it is incalculable inestimable that cannot be estimated and incapable of being ascertained or defined or defined example losses to be covered as a result of all oh, that's one of the example or accident insurance uh, um, or uh, fire insurance so you calculate the damage that is caused and accordingly uh, you know you foresee so sometimes what happens the insurance company will say okay um th there are different types of policy even if there's fire insurance they would say okay i will cover the risk up to a particular extent say the figure is uh, say figure a so it could be any amount of money say ten thousand or twenty thousand whatever you know um uh whatever currency it is like you know say whether it's in terms of dirhams or you know whatever other currency it could be so or dollars or pounds, whatever. So there is a particular limit that the insurance company would really fix for a particular risk. And would say that, okay, as per the insurance policy terms, I would cover the risk to the extent of, say, example, $10,000, example. So what are the characteristics or elements of insurable risk? So the first aspect is the risk sought to be insured must be a pure risk and not suppositional or speculative. That is, suppose that this happens or suppose that that happens. For example, windfall gains, lottery, gambling cannot be insured. So therefore, it should be a pure risk. Next is a determinable loss. So the loss must be determinable, measurable, and capable of being calculated monetarily. Next is the loss must be disappeared as an unintentional loss, which may be accidental. It should be something that is not planned loss. So, for example, if a person plans a loss, or so to say, a person purchases an insurance policy, sorry, excuse me, and then destroys the property, just imagine the situation. So, he purchases an insurance uh, policy and he has, you know, planned it out and he decides to destroy the property that is, you know, illegal in the eyes of law. So, you know, a loss, uh, you know, it it has to be an unintentional loss, not a well-planned loss. Well-planned loss is against the law, of course, and it could even amount to fraud. So the loss for it or the insurance risk to be considered as an insurable risk, the loss must be disappeared as an unintentional loss, which may be accidental. 
Next is vis maja. This is a very, uh, you know, a common concept for, for uh, you know, when it comes to law, and I'm sure you'll come across this term. So vis maja or act of God, also called as fundamental risk in insurance parlance, may be excluded entirely or restricted or limited under standard insurance, thereby the loss should not come within the purview of cataclysmic or catastrophic losses. Um, however, you know, force major insurance, that is, again, a different concept from this measure. This measure is act of God and force major insurance may be sought in case of projects and coverage may be limited and may be placed as political risk coverage, especially if contractors are spread across different countries. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between miss, uh, this major and force major? I'm sure you have studied this earlier. If you remember. See, okay, so with major, as you know, you have seen you have seen the words or the phrase there, act of God. So with major is also called as act of God. Okay, why? Because that covers natural disaster, which is not man-made disaster. So that is with major or act of God, which is not man-made. It is a kind of natural disaster like earthquakes, um, say um, whatever, uh, like you know, storm, cyclones. Uh, all these are, you know, with major act of God, which is a tsunami, which is, uh, no, which, which is not created by man, but, you know, we call it as an act of God, which is uh, beyond a human, uh, uh, you know, human control. So that's an act of God, which, which are also called as acts of nature. But now what is force major? The force major is distinct from with major. Like, for example, I can give you COVID, uh, like, uh, you know, in the year uh, 2020, what happened was uh, there were a lot of contracts which were coming in. I mean, you know, like the world was hit by COVID and, uh, you know, in the legal field, like most of the legal practitioners, consultants and whoever is in the legal uh, field, all of us had a very important question that had come to the table, that is whether COVID is a uh, force major clause because um you know uh, I mean, everybody said because projects were stopped so when projects were stopped so there were people uh, certain people claiming that no because of covid the project is stopped so covid can be a force major clause it can come within the ambit of force major but indeed they said later on after a lot of uh, discussion and many people agreed that said yes covid can come under you know force major but again it depends upon the type of project it is what it is the facts and circumstances of the case but by and large generally uh, you know any outbreak of a contagious disease could come within the ambit of force major that's an example for you or even suppose you know there is government lockdowns or there's a war that takes place uh, something that happens uh uh which is beyond human control, but as a result of, say, uh, say uh, a human decision, or it could be uh, something that, uh, you know, can disrupt the normal working, right? So that could be considered as force major, normal working, like, for example, say terrorist attacks or epidemics or pandemic, COVID is a pandemic. So, or maybe some riots, or there is mass uh, shooting, or, and even natural disasters or with major can come within the ambit of force major but this major is different from force major altogether but force major can include this major right but with major cannot include force major are you understanding me this major does not include force major but force major does include this major any questions Let me put it this way. Force major can include both natural and man-made events. Okay. But with major is purely natural disaster or act of God, right? So this is one of the elements. So I presume that you have understood the concept. And so that's the reason you do not have any questions. So let's move further. Next is capable of leaning on actuarial sciences. 
what is actually science that is a statistical and a mathematical method of assessing financial risk. That is probability analysis with statistics is used to ascertain, analyze and advise solutions to adverse final financial impact that any uncertain event that is or not foreseen may have. Thereby, actuarial science aids insurance companies or supports insurance companies in interpretatively predicting or forecasting the probability of an event and the need of fund disbursal should the event occur. Next is a probability of the loss must be calculable and premiums must be economically feasible. Now, having noted the elements in insurable risk, it can be said that risks that exhibit the five elements expressed above are insurable risks. When you're talking about insurable risk, you can give me the definition and then say it contains or it covers five elements and you can could mention in your answer the five or the seven elements which are here. You could uh, five a uh, basic five elements and I think the sixth one is already repeated earlier saying that it should be a determinable loss. Okay, so five or uh, no, six elements, you can say premiums must be economically feasible. So the six elements, so it encompasses six basic, five basic elements and plus one six. So you could say six elements that express about our insurable risk. So thereby insurable risk is a risk that is capable of being insured and has the element of measurability, calculability, probability, and that which leans on actual science with economic feasibility, feasible premiums can be referred to as insurable risk. So example, pure risk, property risk, personal risk, life insurance, liability risk are the types of insurable risks. What are non-insurable risks? Non-insurable risks are risks that cannot be insured since they are indeterminable, cannot be determined, incalculable, cannot be calculated, improbable, probability cannot be really determined, and may involve the element of speculation. So they are also referred to as uninsurable risks. For example, is windfall gains. What is the example of windfall gain? Again, is lottery. Then you have, uh, you know, gambling, pandemic risks and times, reputational risk, political risk, and so on. So insurance companies do not cover such risks to reduce their liability and losses. And that insurance is all about pooling resources and disbursing to the claimants at the time of legitimate need or at the end of the policy. What's the basic principle? Is pooling of resources and then disbursing it to the right party when there is a particular calamity or when the insurance policy matures. So broadly, risks that may be insurable or uninsurable can be categorized as follows. One is calculable risk or pure risk, that is insurable risk. And one is speculative, or the second one is speculative risk, that is uninsurable. Now, third is fundamental risk. Example was major reactive god, earthquake, flood, storm, tornado, force major, bore epidemic, pandemic, including risk major, of course, because I told you the difference. And I said that force major includes risk major. The risk major cannot include, uh, cannot, uh, you know, be called as coming within the ambit of, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, this major can be included and can be called as part of force major, but force major independently cannot be called as, uh, uh, sorry, this major cannot be called as force major, but force major can include this major. That is, act of God uh, can be said to be as part of force major, but just only force major cannot be said that it is, you know, it it, it includes with major, of course. Uh, and for example, uh, you know, strikes or lockouts or, or uh, you know, uh, um, non-induced fire cannot be called as an act of God. So next is the static risk. Static risks are risks that are untainted and clear and probable risks. So example is, again, risk of theft, risk of accidents, now again, this is insurable. Next is dynamic risk. Dynamic risks are risks that are subject to changes in the economy. And uh, since such a risk is speculative in nature with three possible outcomes of either gain, loss, or break even, so it is not uh, insurable and thereby is an uninsurable risk. For example, the market changes or inflation risk, political risk, um, or reinvestment risk, and so on. So that is dynamic risk. And 
uh, dynamic risks cannot be insured and therefore it is called as uninsurable risk or comes within the ambit of uninsurable risk. Now, who is it insured? In general terms, I already told you what is insured and I'm confident that you already know the meaning of insured. But just for the purpose of this class and you know, for the purpose of just elaborating a little bit, Insured refers to people or group of people, whether individuals or corporate who holds or is covered under an insurance policy. So the insured can also be, the, uh, be called as insurance policy holder. The Cambridge English Dictionary defines insured as the person or group of people or organization that is insured in a particular agreement. Now, West Encyclopedia of American Law defines insured as the person who obtains or is, or is otherwise covered by insurance on his or her health, life, or property. The insured in a policy is not limited to the insured named in the policy, but applies to anyone who is insured under the policy. So it is the insurance contract that basically specifies the parties in the insurance policy contract. That is the insurer, the insured, the policyholder, and the beneficiaries. And on the other hand, the insurance clause in an insurance contract, which is a heart of the insurance policy contract that sets out the details, the terms and conditions, and the scope of the insurance. Next is the duties of the insured. So ins insurance superior elucidates the duties of the insured as including the following. One is disclose material information. Whatever is important information has to be revealed, has to be disclosed. Next is avoid concealment and misrepresentation. Report loss or damage. That is, you, you don't try to hide facts. Don't try to, uh, you know, make up facts, make up stories. Uh, don't try to hide or don't try to build up fake stories and there should not be any misrepresentation while procuring an insurance policy. Next is report loss and damage to the authorities immediately. Provide a notice of claim to the insurer. That is, you have to provide a notice of claim to the insurance company in case of any loss or damage that is caused to the property that you have insured or procured an insurance policy against from the insurance company, of course. At that time, you'll have to provide a notice of claim to the insurance company. Next, prepare an, in, an inventory of the damaged or stolen property and provide proof of loss to the insurer. So the inability of the insured to comply with the duties is a ground for breach of contract, cancellation of the policy, and the forfeiture of premiums paid. So in case a person indulges in any of the um, the, the six activities that I mentioned. So that would be um, considered as a material breach of insurance contract and the contract can be canceled. The policy can be canceled. The policy amount can be forfeited. Uh, that is the premiums that the party has paid can be forfeited. That means they can, uh, <clears throat> whatever you have paid, they will not return you back. So they will forfeit the amount. So, it would, so there are two consequences of uh, these five acts, which are not considered right in the eyes of law or considered illegal in the eyes of law when it comes to insurance law. So the insurance company has got the right to consider it as a material breach of insurance contract and they can immediately cancel the insurance policy and also forfeit the, the insurance premiums paid. So therefore there are three primary duties of the insured one is to duty so 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 this these are the primary duties generally speaking i have spoken about six and now here this you could call it as three primary duties one is duty to disclose information that is what kind of information that is reveal any incidences of damage or attached contingent risks if any um that is transferred to the insurer or failure to, to disclose such information <clears throat> sorry may lead to the loss of insurance coverage Two is duty to cooperate with the insurer in the identification, investigation, and resolution of any in providing all information uh, at the time of purchasing the policy and all relevant information, reports, documents at the time of settling the claim. Third is duty to pay regular premiums. That is, premiums vary, again, based on the type of insurance coverage, the age of the insured, 
uh, suppose it's a life insurance policy. So the premiums depend on that, the age of the insured, the jurisdiction area that is a place and the past record of the insured claims of any. However, if the insured fails to pay the premium as mentioned in the insurance contract, then the policy would be rendered invalid and may stand canceled. So while we understand that the insured purchases an insurance policy to safeguard against harm, losses or damages that may be caused as a result of an event, and that the insured pays for the policy and contracts to pay regular premiums in anticipation of being compensated or indemnified of any losses that may occur, that they have sought to be protected. So not all claimants can be considered as insured. So some claimants may be just policyholders and insured, while some may be insured under an insurance scheme of a policy by virtue of which they may be considered as claimants and not insured. For example, company X purchases a general liability insurance. Uh, so say they have a driver, the driver, Mr. Y of the company, inadvertently bumps into the toolkit that belonged to one of the external handmen say Mr. Z for the company. Now here, the external handman can claim for the loss that has been caused to him from the company, which may be disbursed through the insurance company. So, and that this Mr. Z can be considered as a claimant and not the insured. So this is the difference. Next is the omnibus clause. What is this omnibus clause? It's quite an interesting clause here when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, vehicle insurance. So omnibus provisions, the term itself says omnibus. So omnibus, is, you know, finds its place in vehicular insurance. So it's normally found in the standard automobile and vehicle liability policies that extends coverage even to persons not mentioned in the policy. So this omnibus clause applies to individuals who are authorized to use a vehicle that is covered under a valid insurance policy. So what gains prominence here is that the person is permitted to drive the vehicle under a valid permission or authorization sought from the owner. So this is the omnibus clause. Next is who is the insurer? So free dictionary defines insurer as a person or a company offering insurance policies in return from premiums. So Insurancepedia defines insurer as an insurer is a party that agrees to compensate people, companies or other organizations for specific financial losses. A financial loss would include the destruction of a home due to fire or a vehicle to an accident, any event that would put the client in a lesser financial state than before the event occurred. And the insurance company is the insurer. The purchase of the insurance would be the insured. So this is quite clear there. So what are the duties of the insurance company or the insurer? One is payment or indemnification of losses. That is to make good the loss. Uh, it, loss of whom? Loss of the insured party or the third party who may be the claimant or whatever as the case may be, depending upon the type of insurance and the type of claim it is. Next is duty to defend or pay the legal costs of an insured in case of a litigation. Let us explain this by way of an example. Say, for example, there's one Mr. A who has purchased a professional liability insurance and got his cosmetology clinic. You know what's cosmetology, right? A doctor who deals with the, the skin and say cosmetic surgery. Uh, okay, so he's a cosmetologist. So there is a cosmetology clinic cover where he says um, he's uh, actually taken a professional liability insurance and got his clinic covered. And uh, A's, <clears throat> there's a person, a patient, not a patient, basically a client is microderma abrasion treatment. That's a kind of... Um, a treatment that clears the skin to a particular extent. So the person went, underwent a microderma abrasion treatment and it failed. And the person was 32 year old. Uh, so Miss B, um, yeah, Miss B and her face immediately developed pustular pimples as a result of microderma um, abrasion treatment. A is a doctor there. So uh, Miss B underwent that treatment and uh, her face immediately developed pustular pimples. Pustular pimples are, you know, pimples with pus. And she developed rashes that never got healed for six months, despite several treatments and administration of antibiotics. So Miss B's friend was a lawyer. So the lawyer advised her to file a case against the cosmetology clinic and Mr. A, who is a cosmetologist for professional negligence. So in this case, smart Mr. A had already got 
the insurance policy that is professional liability insurance and um, profesh uh, by virtue of that, Mr. A's insurer, that is the insurance company, will be obligated to defend Mr. A in the civil action alleging negligence. So the insurance company will come into the picture and defend the person. Next is the concept of subrogation. So this principle is corollary to the concept of indemnity, where in the insurance company or the insurer takes over the insured insured's right by the insurer. So in simple terms, when the insurance company disburses the amount to the insured and the insured tries to make a claim elsewhere, for instance, through the code of law, then in such a situation, the amount of claim will be subrogated to the insurance company. The insurer to the extent of the amount disbursed to the insured under the relevant insurance scheme insurer on obtaining the consent of the insured and can pursue the party that caused an insurance loss, damage, to the insured in order to recover the amount that is paid in the claim. The next duty is to duty to uh, the duty to settle claims as per the terms mentioned in the insurance contract as per the TNC, that is the terms and conditions. Next is protect the privacy of the insured and the beneficiary as while processing the documents, he will be in possession of personal information like your passport or some ID cards just or your birth certificate sometimes in case it is a life insurance policy. So they 